CNN's town hall with former FBI director James Comey. We're live at William & Mary, where Director Comey attended college. I'm Anderson Cooper. Thanks for joining us. Director Comey has become probably one of the most controversial figures in American politics, criticized by leaders from both parties for his decisions in the 2016 campaign and, of course, during the Trump administration. He's become a target of President Trump, who has called him a liar and says he should be in jail. Since the release of his book, A Higher Loyalty, Truth, Lies, and Leadership, Director Comey has answered questions from a lot of journalists. Well, tonight it is your turn. All the questioners tonight are students, faculty, and staff from William & Mary. The questions are all their own. I'll ask some follow-up questions as well. Let's get started. Please welcome from the class of 1982, double major in chemistry and religion, former FBI Director James Comey. So we got, a, uh, we got a lot of questions from, uh, from students, faculty, and staff, so let's get right to it. This is uh, Zachary Smith. He's getting his master's in chemistry. Zachary, what's your question? Hi, Director Comey. Uh, do you believe that President Trump possesses the moral and mental capacities needed to effectively lead our armed forces, given his uh, unprecedented uh, loyalty pledge, the general temperament, and the uh, documented outbursts? Well, thank you for that question. A really important question. Ten seconds just to thank the students of William and Mary for coming out and for looking so good tonight. Thank you. Thank you. You're trying to get them on your side right no. away. Uh, if they're not on my side, I'm, I'm out of luck. Uh, the, the, that's a really important question. And I don't have concerns about President Trump's physical fitness, whether he has dementia. I've read stuff like that. I don't buy it. I've dealt with him. He seems to be a person of above average intelligence. My concern is with his moral fitness. I don't believe he's morally fit to be president of the United States. And I don't, I never thought I'd say that about a president, and I don't say that lightly. And I say it because a person who sees moral equivalence across both sides in Charlottesville, who treats and speaks about women like pieces of meat, and who lies constantly about things big and small, and insists that we believe the lies, that person's not fit to lead, no less to be the leader of the free world, the president of the United States. And so that's what I believe. So just to be specific, you said he's morally unfit, morally unfit to, to lead the armed forces of the United States? That, well, that was his question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Morally unfit to be president of the United States, which includes commander-in-chief responsibilities. Uh, I want to do a quick follow-up. You had opportunities to stand up to President Trump when you were FBI director. When he uh, talked about saying to you, I need loyalty, or you say he said, I need loyalty, when he said, see your way to letting Flynn go, why didn't you stand up to him face to face, speaking truth to power, saying that's inappropriate for you to ask me? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've asked myself those questions a lot. And I'm sure I could have done it better if I'd been better prepared for those moments. At the dinner, I think I did a reasonably good job. I gave him nothing but silence when he first asked. And then I interjected to try and explain the roles. And so I held my ground pretty well there. But you never said that's inappropriate, sir. Not in those words, no. I think, though, by the end of the dinner, by the time he asked me the second time, a person of his intelligence would know that it was inappropriate to ask that of the FBI director. You said different. You, sorry. You said you were caught off guard uh, the first time. I can understand being caught off guard. Uh, you know, once uh, the second time, wouldn't you be prepared to, for him to say something that? I mean, didn't you did you not give it any thought about standing up? Well, no, I didn't expect him, honestly, to come back to it. But even after the first ask, I interjected. I keep saying that because I had to interrupt to explain the importance of distance between independence of the Justice Department from the White House and the president. And then when he came back to it the second time. But when the, the Flynn thing, that was really the second time he said something that you found objectionable, right? That was before the loyalty. It was the second time that he asked me something, a directive is how I took it, that caught me by surprise. In that circumstance, that's probably the one where there's the fairest criticism that maybe I should have said something in the moment. It honestly didn't occur to me. Instead, I was thinking, I must remember these exact words. And I don't want to be too tough on myself, because honestly, if he didn't know he was doing something he shouldn't do, why did he kick everybody out of the Oval Office to talk to me alone, including my own boss, the Attorney General? So, but that's the area where I think the, the feedback is fairest. We got a chance to see uh, the memos that you wrote uh, immediately a after these, uh, when they were released, uh, detailing your interactions with President Trump. We first got a word of these last year. Uh, you had asked a friend to share some of the details from at least one memo with the New York Times. Uh, I want to go to Evelyn uh, Lawhorn, a senior studying government. Evelyn? Hi. Uh, my question was, do you think that there's any credence to the president's claims that you broke the law when you released your memos? 
I don't. I uh, hope that won't surprise you. I don't. In fact, I think he's just making stuff up. Um, the memos are actually two pieces, and the details matter because the facts matter uh, and should matter even to the president. I sent one memo, unclassified then, still unclassified, and it's recounted in my book, to my friend Dan Richman and asked him to get the substance of it but not the memo out to the media. Separately, I wrote a bunch of memos about my interactions with President Trump, and I was what was called an original classification authority at the FBI, meaning I had the training and the authority to make decisions about what should be classified, what shouldn't. Some of those memos I decided should be classified. Four others, I wrote them and was highly confident they should not be classified. Those four, I kept a copy of the FBI and a copy of my personal safe at home. After I was fired, I put together a legal team of three people, one of whom was Professor Dan Richman at Columbia University. After I had asked him to give this information to the media. I separately gave my legal team four memos, which were unclassified. They included the one that he had gotten to give the substance of it to the New York Times. The bottom line is, I see no credible claim by any serious person that that violated the law. Here's a good thing, though. The Department of Justice is all about accountability. The Department of Justice Inspector General has taken a look at not whether I mishandled classified information, because that's frivolous, but whether I complied with policy as I should in making the memos and in the way I store them. But as somebody who has the authority to classify uh, documents, you know that stuff is sometimes retroactively classified, and I believe one of the documents was retroactively classified, lowest level classification, wasn't it? Sure. So, well, so if you're releasing memos which may later on be classified, which happened to Hillary Clinton as well, aren't you taking a risk? that you think you know, oh, this is not going to be classified, but it turns out one of them was re well, retroactive. I don't think of it as a risk. You're making an educated judgment based on your training and your experience as to what's classified and what's not. So, you, but you did, leak, uh, you did leak memos. I mean, is it okay for somebody at the FBI to leak something, an internal document, even if it's not classified? Isn't that leaking? Well, there's a whole lot wrong with your question, Anderson. First, I didn't leak memos. I asked a friend to communicate the substance of one unclassified well, that, I mean, memo. Whether you Can you I finish know, for a second? Sure, okay. One unclassified memo to the media, and I was really important. I was a private citizen. I was not an FBI employee at that right, time. But it was an internal document. It was a document you had written while you were FBI director. That, that is a leak. I mean, if you tell somebody, don't give them the document, but tell them what's in the document, that's still a leak, no? Well, not to get tangled up in it, I think of a leak as an unauthorized disclosure of classified information. Really? That's I, it? That's, that's a leak? That's how I thought about it as FBI director. We investigated leaks. So unauthorized when, disclosures. In your memo, when you said, uh, that when the president said he was eager to find leakers and would like to nail one to the door as a message. I said that. Shouldn't you be nailed to the door then? I mean, aren't you a leaker? Aren't you a leaker? I mean, you, you gave up a document that was released to the New York Times, information from that document released to the New York Times. I know you say it's not classified, but you're, plenty of people leak non-classified information to reporters, and the White House and the FBI gets upset about it. The FBI gets upset when people make unauthorized disclosures of protected information. There was nothing protected about this. It wasn't classified. It wasn't privileged. So when you it's, were also, FBI director, on, it's also in my book. So when you were FBI director, if somebody on your team had given uh, had given a friend documents that they were writing that, that you were involved with and said, oh, you could just tell the New York Times what's in this document, you wouldn't have had a problem with that? It would depend on what was in the document. But even if, if it's it was not it classified? Was it protected information? Was it investigative information? Was it classified information? Was it grand jury information? So I, I guess I'm surprised that you only think leaks, uh, officially a leak is something that's classified. Yeah, the reason I hesitate is that's how I think about it as a matter, as a lawyer and as the director of the FBI, in practice, the term gets applied to a broad range of things, so I totally get it. I intentionally gave this information to a friend, intending that it be out in the media. I wanted it to get out in the media. Right. As a private citizen, I could do that and did that, just as I've written about it in my book. All right. Uh, the next question comes from Victoria Lopez. Uh, Victoria is a... Uh, uh, she, uh, she has a, she's a senior studying history. And by the way, I should also point out, you're going to be co-teaching a course here at William and Mary in, in the fall. Is yes. Right? Okay, cool. Victoria? Good evening. With the recent release of your memos, do you still think that you are suitable to teach a course on ethics and leadership, and why? I do, for the reasons I said. I mean, the facts really matter, and I believe that I acted appropriately, and I handled the memos appropriately created them for an important and appropriate uh, purpose. So I, I really don't see, and I'd be happy to debate it with anybody. We can debate it in my class, because my mind is open to other points of view, but I don't see it, honestly. 
I want to ask you something else that was in the memos. It was revealed the president, uh, in a conversation with you, according to you, made a joke about how journalists might change their minds about revealing their sources if they spend a night in jail. You laughed in response. What's funny about jailing journalists? Nothing. I laughed to make it clear that was a joke. It was my way of communicating. He must be kidding. Uh, the next uh, question is from Julia Wick. She's a junior who's studying English, and uh, she has a question about some of the allegations in the Steele dossier. Okay. Hi. Uh, what do you think would happen if there were so-called P tapes and they were leaked uh, to the public tomorrow? Would it matter in the long run? That's a question that, first of all, I'm not going to say that word. Uh, that's, a, that's a question that's you're as qualified to answer as I. Uh, I suppose it might matter in the long run to the extent it casts embarrassment and shame upon the leader of our country. Um, but you'll be able to judge that better than I. Uh, you also said in your memos that the president told you twice that he did not spend the night in Moscow around the Miss Universe pageant. Since then, flight records, uh, social media posts, um, congressional testimony, um, also photographs prove that he actually did spend the night in Moscow. What's the, I mean, do you think it's significant that the president lied to you twice about that? It's always significant when someone lies to you, especially about something you're not asking about. It tends to reflect a consciousness of guilt, as we would say in law enforcement. You've noticed that in, in past interactions as a prosecutor, if someone's lying, uh, about stuff you haven't asked about, that's a tell? Right, two tells. If they bring things up you didn't ask about, and if they bring it up and make a false statement about it, that's, it's not definitive, but it certainly makes you very concerned about what might be going on there. Sounds like President Trump did that a lot of times with you, brought up stuff that you haven't asked about. Correct. And again, I don't know what was in his head. I don't know whether he was intentionally misstating a fact to me, or maybe when he said it to me, he thought he had stayed overnight. But he said, I didn't, I'm sorry, that he thought he didn't stay overnight. But he definitely said that. Mm. Um, next question is from uh, Carl Fredericks. Uh, for, excuse me, Friedrichs. He's a professor of marine science here at William & Mary. Carl. Hello. What else do you think Putin might have on Trump that makes Trump so reluctant to criticize Russia? Do you think it might be proof that Russian organized crime money has been laundered through Trump's businesses? I don't know, and I'm not in a position to speculate. As I said, I, I was struck that the president was reluctant to criticize President Putin in public, and then I was very struck that he was reluctant to criticize him in private. What's behind that? I honestly don't know. You've used the word, you've said it's possible many times. Um, do you think, I, I, right now you're saying, I don't know, do you think it's possible? Yes, yeah, I just don't know. And I try to say it's possible because I want to be complete and accurate. I can't rule it out, honestly. Um, but in private conversations with you, the president would not say anything negative about Vladimir Putin. That's correct? Correct. A and was he, did he seem curious about Russian interference in the election? About, did he talk to you about efforts to try to stop it in the next round of elections? He did not. In fact, one of the things we were struck by in our the meeting between myself and the leaders of the other intelligence agencies with the president-elect on January the 6th before he took office was he had no questions and I don't think anybody else had any questions from his team as to what the future threat from Russia might be. And the second piece that you alluded to, in, in the book I describe an encounter with the president on February the 8th of 2017 where he was explaining that he had given a good answer to Bill O'Reilly in an interview that ran during, before the Super Bowl where he said, in essence, we are the same kind of killers as Vladimir Putin. And I interrupted him to criticize that and read, and I, I could be overreading it, but read a very uh, sharp reaction from him. You, you don't believe that there's a moral equivalence between Vladimir Putin and leaders of the United States? I do not, nor do I believe there's a moral equivalence between the people who kill innocent people on behalf of the Russian leadership and the men and women of the United States military and our intelligence community. Do you see Vladimir Putin as a killer? Yes. Next question is from uh, Carl, uh, excuse me. Um, next question is from Daniel Powers. Uh, we got a lot of questions uh, from students, obviously, about the decisions you made before the 2016 election. That's uh, going to come as no surprise for you. Daniel's a senior studying history and computer science. Daniel? Good evening. There is a very compelling case to be made that your announcements, especially the October 28th announcement, cost Hillary Clinton the election. At the same time, you never disclosed how Trump was involved in an FBI investigation into the Russians. Should you have disclosed that to the American public? No, for a couple reasons. First, President Trump 
candidate Trump was not the subject of an FBI investigation. And the decision we had to make during 2016 is what to say about the Russian interference and then what, if anything, to say, and we honestly didn't give it serious thought for reasons I can explain, about a brand new counterintelligence investigation of a small group of Americans to try to figure out is there any connection. Those, those small group of Americans were, uh, some of them were associates of the campaign, no? Correct. Correct. I don't think they've been identified publicly by the FBI or the government, so I can't use the names, but a small group that did not include uh, President Trump. Um, wasn't George Papadopoulos one of those people? I don't know whether the FBI has confirmed who the small group of people were, so I don't want to say sitting here, Anderson. Okay. Um, but just go, if you can, just go into some more detail about that, because, I mean, it, we really, we got a lot of questions on this, and I yeah. think, obviously, people on, on all sides of the political aisle question your motives, question your actions, question your, your thought process uh, on this. What was the, you, I know you said it was early days in a counter, uh, counterintelligence investigation, but um, you've also talked about wanting to protect that investigation. Um, was it more important to protect the early days of a counterintelligence investigation than it was to be transparent to the American people about something that might affect their vote? In a way, yes. Let me, can I just explain that? It's important, because the question is a very, very important and reasonable question. It appears to a lot of folks you treated the Hillary Clinton case different than the Russia case. And here it's important to realize the Hillary Clinton case began as a public referral from an inspector general to the FBI. The subject of the investigation was the candidate herself. And we still refused to confirm that it existed for three months. We started it in July of 2015. We wouldn't confirm it even existed until October. And then we said nothing until it was done. Look at the counterintelligence investigation. They began in late July of 2016 with information sufficient to open an investigation that the, maybe there's some connection between this big thing that the Russians are doing and Americans. And so we opened on a small group of Americans to try and figure out, is there anything there? And so the reason I said there was no serious consideration given to talking about it, try to imagine what we might say in the summer of 2016. We just opened an investigation. We don't know if there's anything to it. Doesn't involve candidate Trump, but there's some people around him. We're going to look into it. That's something that the FBI and the Justice Department would never do for a bunch of reasons. First, unfair to the targets of the investigation subjects, but also lets them know we're looking at it when we don't know what we have. The Department of Justice authorized me to talk about that the next spring to reassure the American people that we were looking at it. But they never, for reasons I think make sense, considered doing that in the summer before the election. What we wrestled with and struggled with and President Obama struggled with was what should we say to the American people about the big thing that the Russians are doing? That they're trying to interfere in our election, to hurt Hillary Clinton, to help Donald Trump, to dirty up our democracy. What should we say? And there, I offered to be the voice of inoculation to the American people, telling them, here's what the Russians are doing in the summertime. They didn't take me up on it, but that was the big discussion during the election year. You just said, though, earlier that um, part of your thought process was, we don't know where this counterintelligence investigation of people associated with the campaign, President Trump's campaign, is going to go because it's so early days. When you announced you were reopening the investigation of Hillary Clinton into the new emails that had been found on uh, Anthony Weiner's uh, computer, um, you didn't know where that was going to go. You didn't know the significance of those emails. You didn't know what, what was in those emails. And yet, so y you didn't know that, but you chose to inform the American people of that, which many, you know, certainly supporters of, of, of Secretary Clinton view as a decisive moment in the campaign. Yeah, and the reason was we could only see two options at that point. We, meaning the Justice Department and the FBI, had told the American people in the summer of 2016, we're done here. We've done a professional investigation. There's no there there. Move on and taken tremendous hits for that decision. But having said that repeatedly to the American people, to restart the investigation in a hugely significant way in late October and not talk about it put us on the horns of a dilemma. Not speaking about something where you've said the opposite under oath repeatedly is a concealment. Speaking is also really bad. So which do you choose? Do you speak or do you conceal? The challenge we faced then is we couldn't find a door that said no, op no action here. Here's the door to be quiet because either way you choose, you're choosing an action. Do you speak or do you conceal? 
And reasonable people can see this differently. It was a nightmare of a decision, but we chose to speak because it was bad. Cat catastrophic was the second option. Concealing would be catastrophic to the organizations of justice. So that's why we chose it. But in the announcement on Hillary Clinton, the first one in which you said, uh, you know, th this is not going to be prosecuted, you didn't just say the investigation is over. You went on to criticize her handling of emails, which is an unusual step, no, for an FBI director. Normally, you would just say the investigation is done. You wouldn't explain more. Right. In, in almost every case, we say nothing about a completed investigation except where, and this is recognized in Justice Department policy, there's an overriding public interest in having more transparency. We gave that in Ferguson, Missouri, after the investigation there, gave it after the Tea Party targeting investigation. Here, my judgment was, and the judgment of the FBI senior team, if we don't offer that transparency, the result has no credibility. If we just say one line, we know it's the middle of the election, and this is one of your candidates, but we're done. But I guess the, the question then was if there's a uh, Justice Department policy allows you to give more information if there's an overriding public interest, couldn't you make that argument about uh, associates of, of the Trump campaign? You, you could if you knew what you had and if it was an investigative stage, we're talking about it would be responsible. If we had finished a counterintelligence investigation of people close to the president, and we were in a similar posture, it would have been a much closer call because you would have had that important exception to policy, which is if the if it was powerful public interest, but it wasn't implicated in those counterintelligence cases. All right, I want to bring in uh, another student. This is uh, Emily Holtzman. She's a senior studying government. Emily? Mr. Comey, my question for you is, if you wanted the Bureau to remain independent, why did you factor the legitimacy of a Hillary Clinton victory into your, decision, into your decision to announce she was being investigated prior to the election? Isn't this a political consideration? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I hope you get a chance to read my book. I don't remember consciously thinking about politics and polls during that period of time. In fact, I worked very hard to push it out of my head and just ask this question. Which of these two nightmare choices both of which are awful, speaking or concealing, which is most consistent with the values of the institutions of justice, FBI and the Justice Department, which will do the least lasting damage to the FBI and the Justice Department. But the question I ask myself in the book is, given that the whole world assumed that Hillary Clinton was going to be elected, could that have had an effect on me? And the answer is, of course it could. The, the air I was breathing was, Hillary Clinton's going to be elected, but this is something I don't think I make clear in the book, the answer would be the same. As between those two options, no matter where the polls stood, you can't conceal a material, a huge change in facts from the American people when you've told them the opposite. So as between bad and catastrophic, no matter where the polls are, you're always going to have to choose bad. And no, you're going to get hammered for it, but no, you had two choices, and you chose the least bad. L let me ask you. Um Shouldn't I mean, the, your book is about leadership, and, and in the book you're saying that, uh, and you just said it basically that you uh, you, you may have uh, your your beliefs that she was going to be the next president may have subconsciously impacted uh, the, the way you acted. Shouldn't a good leader be aware of assumptions that they are making in the moment, not just in in hindsight? Sure, if you can if you can bring them to consciousness and. And I'm, I'm telling you the truth, I don't remember intentionally thinking about the polls, and if that makes sense to me, because the FBI wouldn't want to track the polls. I do remember one of my best lawyers at the FBI, a brilliant woman, asked a searing question, which I describe in the book. She said, should you consider that what you're about to do may help elect Donald Trump president of the United States? And I said, great question, thank you for asking it, not for a second. Because down that path lies the death of the FBI as an independent organization, as an independent law enforcement organization. Because if we start considering whose fortunes will be affected in which way, we're just another part of the partisan tribal warfare. And so I remember it coming up. I was so glad she asked that question and then pushing it to the side. What I'm trying to do, which I, I guess has surprised people, is offer introspection uh, in a book. And I don't remember it. But it must have been part of the atmosphere in some way. You said uh, now that you think the country would be better if Hillary Clinton had been elected president. Why do you think that? I think the question I was asked was, maybe it wasn't the question, my answer was based on values. I think the American people were faced with a historic choice between the two most unpopular and least trusted candidates in modern history. 
as between the two, looking backwards in hindsight, and I didn't vote, as you, I hope you know, that Hillary Clinton is more enmeshed in, trained in, respectful of the norms and traditions that I'm so worried about being eroded today. So on that basis, not a policy judgment, but on that basis, yeah, I, that's why I said that. Do you think Hillary Clinton would have fired you as FBI director? I don't know. Well, uh, but come on, you, you must have given it some thought. I mean, if, if you think she's going to win, you must have... I didn't think Donald Trump was going to fire me as FBI director. <laughs> Honestly. And so I, I didn't, I, I really didn't spend time thinking about it. And I don't know the answer, even looking backwards, whether she would have. I find it hard to believe, though, that you think this person to be elected president and you don't even have, I mean, just for, you know, a question of where you're going to live next, you weren't thinking, wow, I wonder if she's going to keep me after what I've done on, on the investigation. No, and maybe that sounds weird until you think about the, the mindset when you become FBI director. President Obama was really specific in explaining to me that he thought the most important personnel choices that a president makes are Supreme Court and FBI director. He said, because I'm picking you for the future, because I had a 10-year term. Now, the president lawfully can fire the FBI director, but Congress created that term after Watergate to send a signal to create a culture of longevity, and that's, that's the attitude with which I entered the job, and so I just, with no matter who was going to be president, and including when I was having difficult times with President Trump, I was assuming I'll be here another six years as FBI director. Mm. Um, this is uh, Emma White. She's a senior studying psychology. Hey, Emma. In your book, you describe the qualities of an ethical leader. Do you think that effective leaders have to be ethical leaders? And how would you describe President Trump's style of leadership? I think effective leaders, to be effective in, in anything near the long term, have to be ethical. And what I mean by ethical is make decisions with an eye towards lasting values, above the urgency of the quarterly earnings statement or individual feelings of political forces or the news, but look at the long term and care deeply about helping their people reach their potential and find meaning in the work. To me, that's the only way to be effective as a leader, to be an ethical leader. And, and one other thing I'll say, to bring truth to the center of your enterprise, whether it's a nonprofit or a company or the government to have truth at the center of it, the truth about yourself and about the, the, tr the troubles that you're dealing with, it's the only way to be effective in the, long, in the long run. I don't believe that about President Trump. And the reason I say that is ethical leaders have external reference points. When they're making hard decisions, they draw on philosophy or religious tradition or logic or history. They draw on a set of norms and values that help them lift their eyes and figure out what the right decision is. As best I can tell, President Trump doesn't have any external reference points. And it's a hard thing to say, but I believe it. His only reference point is internal. What will bring me what I need? What will fill this hole in me, get me the affirmation I crave? And that's deeply concerning, because the only way you make hard decisions is by looking to the external reference points. You can't ignore the internal, of course, but your first move and your primary move is always to those external points of reference to help you make a good decision. So that's why I say that. You've said, and you mentioned uh, hit, uh, what you say is the president's need for affirmation. Is that something you saw in conversations with him, that in one-on-one -on -one conversations he was looking for something from you, uh, positive, something to affirm, something to make him feel good? Yes. His, at least with me, his style of conversation was a series of assertions about great things he had done. And biggest crowd at the inauguration, awesome inauguration speech, these things that I have done. And the challenge I found was that they wash over you like a wave. And even if you disagree, that the waves just keep coming, but that's the style. It's I'm great, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great. And I suppose if there's a pause, it's to, you know, to elicit a response of a similar nature. But that struck me. It also struck you, and I thought this was interesting, I had never thought about it, that you've never seen him laugh. Yeah. The, what is that, why is that significant? Yeah, that, it's a great question. The, the mark of a great leader, I believe, is a combination of things that seem contradictory. Enough confidence to be humble. That is what an effective leader has. They're comfortable in their own skin, and it allows them to shut up and learn the truth from those around them and to take joy in their people, to love seeing them shine. Insecure people can't do any of that. They can't listen. They can't take joy in the achievements of those around them. And a marker of that balance of confidence and humility is humor. That if you are insecure, you cannot laugh. 
for two reasons. First, you look silly laughing, and so you expose yourself. And engaging in a humorous encounter with somebody else is a risk for an insecure leader because I might have to acknowledge you that you said something funny that I didn't say. And so I saw Presidents Bush and Obama both use humor effectively to relax, to put at ease, to try and get to the truth. I never saw President Trump laugh, even in an almost hour and a half long private dinner. And so I became a little concerned about this. Maybe it just doesn't find you funny. Well, it could be. There's a lot of people. <laughs> A lot of, and it could be I missed, you know, reams of hilarity that have been captured elsewhere on videotape. But I've actually looked for this. I've tried to find examples. And I could be overinterpreting this, but I, I tried to find examples of him laughing, and I could only find one in searching YouTube. And it, <laughs> it, it was a... Is that what you've been doing the last couple of months? Basically. Uh, yeah. And writing. Basically, that's two things. Okay. Sleeping, eating, and YouTube, and book. And I, I looked for it, and I found one, which was a rally in New Hampshire where he's speaking and a dog starts barking. And he said, what's that? And someone yelled, it's Hillary Clinton. And so then he laughed, but a really mean kind of laugh. And that's the only one I could find. And so to me, that's a tell that's very concerning. Just as a positive tell is a leader who can laugh, especially at themselves, to try and get to the truth with their people. Um, I want to introduce uh, Abhi uh, Chada. He's a sophomore studying finance and, and government. Welcome. Good evening, Director Comey. Hello. In your experience with the Trump administration, what did you feel was the attitude of the administration towards established government institutions such as the FBI? Did, you feel that, did they feel that these institutions were antagonistic towards the goals of the administration? Or was there some level of willingness to cooperate in your experience? In my experience, and, and so it's both the five months I worked under President Trump and since, they view the institutions of justice with contempt as just another piece on the board. When that piece is doing something that the leadership doesn't like, it should be knocked over and dirtied up. And that is a terrible place for us to be as a country. The FBI is not politicized. That's nonsense. The FBI, though, is being politically attacked. And the reason that is so dangerous and so stupid, even if you're a Republican, we need those institutions. All of us need those institutions. And there's a reason that Lady Justice wears a blindfold. So she's not peeking out to see what President this or President that thinks about her decisions. Without that, without that blindfold, one of the major pillars of this democracy is lost, and that is, should be deeply worrying to all of us, including Republicans in Congress who know better. It's not just the FBI, though, as an institution which is under attack. You have confidence in the strength of, of the institutions. I've, I've had... Uh, um, uh, former uh, well, General Michael Hayden on my program a lot, and he's talked about the, the thin veneer of civilization and how thin that veneer actually is. We like to think it's very deep and, and solid and everlasting. Uh, he uses the example of Sarajevo, a multicultural uh, city, which uh, was, was you know, uh, for, uh, laid siege to for, for years. Um, what gives you the belief that the institutions are strong enough? Because I know them. And because I know no president serves long enough to destroy the culture that is at the root of them. I hear this term, deep state, all the time. And I, there's no deep state. But there is a deep culture and a commitment to the rule of law, equal protection of the laws, the fundamental values that are at the core of our Constitution that runs really deep in the FBI, the Justice Department as a whole, the intelligence community, the United States military services. It is the ballast that gives me comfort, and I hope should give all Americans comfort, but that can be damaged in significant ways. I don't think any president serves long enough to destroy that, to flip that ship over. But if we are silent, tremendous damage will be done that will take us time to recover from. You said there's no deep state, but you talk about a deep culture. It doesn't sound that much different. I mean, a deep culture which you know, has ways of doing things and believes it is the right way of doing things, isn't that some of what President Trump was elected to shake up? Absolutely not. I'm talking about a culture of commitment to the rule of law and to the values enshrined in our Constitution. That's the value at the heart of the United States military and the intelligence community and the law enforcement community. No one, I hope, voted for him with the idea that he would destroy those values. And so that's what I mean by a deep culture. It's a culture that we should celebrate and the rest of us who are not part of it ought to make sure we call it out when we see it threatened and damaged. So when some say the deep state is trying to destroy President Trump, you're saying point blank that's not true? That's nonsense. 